uh, hope you hope you people can hear me uh, i am not sure the uh, the today's resource person whether she is she has joined she is joining from uk inosha are you there I cannot contact her either through messenger. Wait, wait, wait. Now I have to address you. Mother, I'm oh, putting. Uh, am I can hear you. on air? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are audible. Uh, I, okay. Yeah. Right, we'll start. Right. Okay. Uh, okay, guys, uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, you know, Shashi just came from work. You know, it's uh, UK time is still the evening. Evening means a, it's uh, 3.45. Yeah, 3.45. Right. So let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Inosha Bamarand. Uh, uh, another brilliant product from Peradinia from uh, 2003 batch. When I was, uh, we were in the training together when I was a senior registrar in Colombo Professoral Unit, Inosha was the registrar. And uh, those days we were ruling the, the pair of graduates were ruling the uh, uh, Colombo Professorial Unit. Am I correct, Inosha? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's our two registrars and uh, another three or four brilliant house officers uh, with very good merit, about 50. So uh, they were the basically Kalamu profit were ruled by the uh, in the absent guy unit were mainly from the pair of graduates. But Inosha is uh, uh, doing uh, she did general absent guy now she has sub specialized in uh, uh, fertility. So she's undergoing uh, she's almost a consultant in Sri Lanka. She's undergoing her uh, foreign training in uh fertility right so uh it's uh, again you know the objective of this second series of pems lectures it should be a discussion and uh, she will cater you all according to your need right and uh, free uh, feel free to ask any questions and uh, yeah we'll start inosha over to you okay um, thank you, uh, Dr. Gihan, for that lovely introduction. Um, so it's uh, lovely to uh, see a lot of students today. I'm just, okay, so 97 participants, that's great. So um, I'm not good with tech and I'm, I'm, I'm quite sorry I'm late for this lecture. Um, so um, I think you can um, raise hand when you want to ask a question. Uh, there's a raise hand option here, right? Yeah, you know, so they will raise hand or same time they will chat, uh, they will send you the text Answers. messages through in the chat box. All right, so and can you ask. can, yeah. okay, so you can chat with me as well. Okay, um, so, um, so I'm Dr. Inosha, I'm currently undergoing uh, my uh, training in fertility in UK, um, and it's a pleasure to meet you all today. Um, I hope you all are having a nice time in Peradeniya. Uh, we certainly did. Uh, so, yeah. So, and um, yeah, for the current Ops and Gen group, we are giving a nice time and we gave for the previous groups. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, yeah, um, it's, a, it's a pity I cannot see your faces today. Uh, it, it would have been much nicer if I could see your faces and interact with you at the same time. Um, so what I'm, I'll be doing is, uh, so these are final year medical students, right? You know, Shah, my final years are there, uh, mm -hmm. who are sitting for the final MBBS exam in March. Same mm -hmm. time, they are juniors <laughs> and they are super juniors are also, also joining. All right. It's a mix, uh, but you can basically cater for the final year. Okay, so I think this lecture is going to be mainly beneficial 
for the final year. So what I'll be doing is um, um, I'll be doing some case-based scenarios um, and then doing some M MCQs afterwards. Uh, but I'll give you a brief introduction uh, to infertility first, just to recap your memory. Um, I think you all have done uh, quite a lot of learning um, with regard to theory. So it's just uh, brushing your clinical uh, knowledge today, okay? So I, I expect you to have the baseline, basic knowledge. Um, I'll, just, uh, I'll just run through the, rush through the first few slides of my presentation. And then uh, we'll have a discussion uh, with the case discussion. Um, so I expect you to answer my questions today and I can answer you know, any of your questions um, according to my knowledge today. Um, so just uh, chat with me because uh, then I'll know you're not sleeping during my lecture, okay? Uh, so I'll just share my screen. Okay, can you see the lecture? Yeah, we can, yeah, we can see it. All right. All right. So today, first of all, I'll be discussing the menstrual cycle with you because I think uh, without knowing the menstrual cycle, you would not be uh, able to solve any problems uh, with regard to infertility. And then I'll briefly discuss uh, causes of infertility, um, importance of history, points not to be missed during examination, and then I'll do some case dis discussions as well. Um, if I'm too fast, uh, just stop me at any time and uh, uh, give me your feedback, okay? <clears throat> so uh, I hope all of you can remember the menstrual cycle. Um, you have the pituitary working, um, secreting um, FSH and LH, which acts on the ovary um, to help with the ovulation. And the, uh, during the process, the hormone secreted by the ovary acts on the endometrium to prepare the womb lining uh, for an implantation. So as you can see, in the beginning of a menstrual cycle, um, you have rising FSH hormone levels, okay, which acts on the ovary um, to make the follicles grow um, towards uh, ending in ovulation in the end, okay? So during the process, um, the granulosa cells surrounding the oocyte secrete estrogen hormone, which in turn acts on the endometrium uh, to proliferate the endometrium. Um, and at the same time, the estrogen hormone secreted by the ovary gives a negative feedback to the pituitary, thereby reducing the FSH secretion sometime later on in the first half of the cycle. So what happens is, because the FSH level tends to go down a little bit um, during the second half of uh, the initial days of a menstrual cycle, um, the follicle that has the most number of FSH receptors, which would become the dominant follicles um, and the other follicles which were destined to uh, grow towards an ovulation, undergo atresia, and only one follicle uh, becomes a mature follicle in order to be prepared for the ovulation. So the estrogen secretion keeps on rising. And, then at, at, and at one point, um, this gives a positive feedback uh, on the pituitary giving rise to the LH rise. This LH surge in turn um, induces ovulation and it gives the final maturation to the oocyte as well. 
So after ovulation, um, the remaining follicle in the uh, ovary uh, is called the corpus luteum and it produces progesterone, which acts on the endometrium to prepare it for the implantation. Uh, that's called the secretory phase of the endometrium. So as you can see, um, the highest progesterone levels are seen at the mid-luteal phase. And um, you'll understand then why we, we are conducting mid-luteal progesterone um, to assess ovulation, because as you can see, day 21 is the highest, um, shows the highest level of progesterone here. Um, this, this is in a 28-day um, menstrual cycle. So after some time, if the implantation does not occur, the corpus luteum regresses. There's no more progesterone support for the endometrium. Endometrium breaks down and that results in a period. Okay, so as you can see, the baseline FSH levels um, and FSH and LH levels along with the estrogen, baseline estrogen levels are seen in the beginning of a menstrual cycle. And uh, that explains why you would want to do, if you want to assess FSH and LH levels um, in a person who's not ovulating, you would like to do that in the first five days of a period, because that's the, <clears throat> those, those are the days you would get the baseline levels of FSH and LH, okay? So what is infertility? Um, it is inability to um, conceive despite regular unprotected intercourse uh, for more than one year. And you would know by regular unprotected intercourse, it means at least having sex around two to three times per week. Okay. So what are the causes for infertility? So you need sperms and you need a patent reproductive female um, reproductive tract uh, for the sperms to reach the um, oocyte. And then the fertilization needs to occur. Um, and then the endometrium should be receptive for an implant implantation. So you should need a patent vagina, um, patent womb cavity, and working fallopian tubes, the sperms to reach here. Um, and then after fertilization, again, you need working fallopian tubes because the embryo rolls down the tube back into the endometrium. And at this point, the endometrium should be receptive for an implantation. Um, if you categorize it, 30% of the causes could be female, 30% could be due to male problems, 20% um, could be mixed problems, and 20% can be due to unexplained infertility, where you can identify any cause using investigations uh, for their infertility. So um, as students, um, you need to know how to take a history uh, from an infertile couple, um, how to do an examination, how to come to the tentative diagnosis and what investigations to carry out because it's quite likely that you would get a patient with infertility for your final exam, uh, because it's quite easy to recruit patients from the subfertility clinic, okay? Um, so in the um, introduction, um, it's, it's, so you have to remember, you are taking a history from a couple, not just from the female. You have to always think about the male partner. And also uh, the female history is basically a gynecological history. You just have to target your history uh, towards like uh, assessing factors uh, for infertility. So in the introduction, don't forget to ask about the um, smears and the last menstrual period. Um, and then you go on according to, to the causes, excluding um, causes one by one. So the first thing you need to ask whether, is whether the woman is ovulating or not. You can have an idea whether the woman is ovulating or not by taking a proper menstrual history. 
um, most commonly, if someone is having regular periods, that would suggest that woman is ovulating. But very rarely, some people don't ovulate, although they are having regular um, periods. Uh, but at your level, if someone is having regular periods, um, you would think that this woman is having um, regular ovulation, monthly ovulation. <laughs> then um, you need to assess uh, whether uh, the woman has any symptoms uh, or suggestive of endometrial or pelvic pathology. You need to assess whether they have any risk factors for tubal pathology or whether they have any risk factors uh, for like abnormal implantation where, the, they, ha where they have abnormal uterine cavity. So dysmenorrhea is very, very important, especially if it's a secondary dysmenorrhea, uh, which could be a symptom of uh, endometriosis or pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, along with deep dyspareunia, again, suggesting, suggestive of a pelvic pathology, uh, past history of uh, STI, sexual transmitted infections, again, um, make you um, think this woman is at risk of a uh, tubal factor infertility, past pelvic surgeries. Again, tubes can be distorted. There could be additions. And also, um, if they have had multiple surgeries in their uh, ovaries, um, their egg reserve can become low. And if you have additions in your ovaries, your ovaries are distorted. They are not in the correct place. Sometimes it could be difficult to access their ovaries during IVF and also um, irregular bleeding, such as intermenstrual bleeding, postcoital bleeding, which could suggest uh, endometrial pathology, such as submucosal fibroids, polyps, adenomyosis, and you, you have to ask about congenital abnormalities, such as uh, uh, vaginal septum, imperforate hymen, those things could give rise to infertility as well. So then um, you need to know what investigations they have undergone so far, because you don't want to keep on repeating the investigations um, unless you want to update them if they have been done like quite a long while back. Um, but if someone has undergone a lot of investigations, there's no point um, repeating the same investigations over and over again. Okay, and then what treatment have they undergone so far? Again, if they under, have undergone ovulation inductions for about 12 cycles, uh, you wouldn't want to um, do ovulation induction again. You'll move on to the next step. Again, if they have undergone so many IUIs, more than 12 cycles, more than six cycles, you would advise them on IVF. So you need to know what treatment um, they have undergone so far because you'll be working um, from that point upwards, you'll be moving to the next treatment stream. Any relevant medical or surgical history? Sometimes uh, the woman or, could have many medical conditions which could contraindicate a pregnancy. So you need to know whether they can do fertility treatment in that case. Um, um, surgeries in the past, uh, again, as I told you, um, if they have like a distorted pelvic anatomy, um, they might have uh, hydrosalpinges, uh, which can reduce the success rate of IVF. Again, their ovaries could not be, um, sometimes uh, might not be uh, accessible during uh, a collection during IVF. So those things you need to know. Social history is quite important uh, because most of the time they, these couples, they are quite distressed. Uh, by the fact um, they are infertile um, and that affects their social interactions. So you need to have a detailed social history um, and most of the fertility treatment uh, treatments, uh, they're not available in the government sector and it could be quite costly to undertake those treatments. So you need to know whether these people can afford such treatment for example, um, one cycle of IVF it costs up to like seven to 10 lakhs in the private sector. Um, so you need to know uh, whether they can afford and what their social circumstances are, okay? 
Um, then you need to have a, a brief uh, mail history as well. Uh, so here uh, you uh, ask about uh, risk factors for any sperm problems, such as past history of infection, such as epididymokitis, mumps or chitis, whether they have undergone any surgeries, um, um, such as hernia surgery, which could affect their spermatic cord at the time, um, medical problems, again, um, sometimes um, chronic diabetes with neuropathy could give rise to erectile dysfunction, um, and other medical problems and their treatments could give rise to abnormal sperm parameters, congenital problems such as undescended testicles and their lifestyle, smoking, alcohol, um, uh, drugs, um, those things you have to ask, okay? <clears throat> so I'm not telling everything you need to ask here. I'm just recapping your memory on the most important things, all right? Um, so on examination, on female examination, BMI is quite important uh, because it, it's becoming uh, quite a problem um, in the infertile population. Um, most of the time, uh, these uh, people with obesity present with an ovulation. Um, so until the patient achieves a comparable BMI, uh, you would not... Uh, think of starting any other fertility treatment, that would be the treatment itself, reducing the BMI. So don't ever forget the BMI of the woman when you're examining a female patient. Uh, and then signs of thyroid disease. Thyroid disease is quite important because this patient is going to get pregnant and uh, thyroid problems during pregnancy can lead to fetal problems. Um, signs of polycystic ovarian syndrome, such as hirsutism, and signs of insulin resistance, uh, acanthosis, nigricans, and all that. Signs of chromosomal or congenital abnormalities. Sometimes you might get a patient with Turner syndrome uh, with infertility. Um, and then uh, you need to do a thorough um, gynecological examination, which includes a speculum in. Uh, examination and a bimanual examination. Okay. Male examination, again, you can look for signs of hyperandrogenism, congenital abnormalities, and when you are examining the genitalia, testicular size is quite important, presence or absence of vast difference, and presence or absence of varicoceles, hydroceles, and etc. So what are the investigations you would carry out in a couple with infertility? Oh, I'm going to ask a question. Anyone? So here, yeah. So can someone answer my question? What investigations you would carry out? Hands up, anyone? Dr. Gihan, are you still there? Let's see. Madam? Yes, can someone answer my question? For female course, we can take the day 21 progesterone level and transfer general. Uh, ultrasound scan for follicular tracking mm -hmm. and the hormonal test like FSH, LH and prolactin uh, those hormones also can be checked mm -hmm. in, the, in the male course uh, we can take the seminal fluid analysis mm -hmm. uh, okay. uh, and also hormone level can be checked in the male males also mm -hmm. uh, uh, genetic evaluations can be checked for congenital cause and testicular failure. Uh, those. Okay, so what's your name, Puta? I'm Sajat. Ah, very good, very good. So, I mean, your answer was correct, um, but um, are you in final year? No, madam, fourth year. All right, very good for fourth year. So if you were in final year, I would expect something like, so I would um, cater my in investigations um, 
according to my history, okay? So for example, if someone had, if, if a woman has a no, normal 28 day cycles, um, you don't um, like, you don't have to do, so you have to always uh, do your investigations and think twice whether you need to do this, whether is, is this essential for my management, okay? Um, if, if there's any suspicion, you can always do that. But if someone is having regular 28 day cycles, you don't have to always uh, confirm ovulation by doing um, tests such as day 21 progesterone um, and follicular tracking. You assume that patient is ovulating, uh, but if someone is having irregular cycles, you have to do all those investigations. Um, so you can do a, so it's not always day 21 progesterone, you call it mid luteal progesterone, okay? Um, so you have to do it um, in the mid luteal phase to see whether the patient is ovulating, okay? Um, and if someone is having irregular cycles, you need to see um, where the problem is. Um, the Problem can be at the hypothalamus pituitary level or ovarian level. So it's like an investigating amenorrhea. So you would do FSH LX along with the estrogen levels and according to the symptoms, if the patient has uh, symptoms of and signs suggestive of polycystic ovarian syndrome, you would cater your investigations um, towards that. If the patient has symptoms suggestive of thyroid problems, you cater your investigations towards that. But always you can do a full hormone profile in a patient who's having an ovulation. <clears throat> okay? So you would cater your uh, investigations according to your history. But semen analysis is something you always have to do. Okay? Um, if the patient is um, having regular cycles, um, I mean, I wouldn't worry about confirming it, uh, but if that's how we were taught, um, you can do day 21 progesterone um, and follicular tracking. So what are the tests um, you can do to um, assess ovulation? Can someone tell me how you would um, carry out uh, mid luteal progesterone levels, how, how would you uh, assess that in a practical way if someone is having irregular cycles? So how would you know the mid luteal phase? Anyone? Anyone? None? Hundreds, three students here, come on. How would you do a mid luteal progesterone? Like when, on which day you would do if someone is having irregular cycles? You know, uh, around one week before the expected menstrual peak. Mm -hmm. So if someone is having um, cycles uh, from 35 days to 60 days, how would you do that? Someone has said fourth day after menstruation. I'm asking about um, progesterone levels. So you know why we are doing the progesterone levels in the mid luteal phase? If you can go back to the menstrual cycle, mid luteal phase is the uh, time where you have the highest progesterone levels and you get high progesterone levels if only someone ovulates, okay? All right, so yatapana gave the correct answer. So you do it on the day 21 and then repeat the test weekly until the patient has a period. But the problem comes, if someone has 60 day periods, are you going to keep on doing it? Like for how many weeks you have to do it? So it's not practical, right? So if someone is not having, a, if someone is having more than 35 days cycles, you would assume the patient is an ovulatory and then you carry on the other investigations to assess a cause for an ovulation rather than doing day 21 progesterone because you know the patient is not, not ovulating anyway. But if someone is having cycles which are less than 35 days, you could do the um, 
B21 progesterone levels and then keep on repeating them weekly till the patient has a period. So you can prove an ovulation. If the patient is ovulating, you don't need to do ovulation induction in that patient. In that sense, you can uh, assess a patient um, like that, but if someone is having longer cycles, um, you'd rather not, you will investigate for other causes uh, to see where the problem is, okay? Um, so follicular tracking, how do you do? <clears throat> how do you um, do carry out follicular tracking? Again, if someone is having a day 28, 28 day cycle, you can, uh, so you expect the patient to ovulate around day 14. So you can start scanning them around day nine or 10 and keep on scanning the patient. Um, see the dominant follicle growing and at one point it disappears. So you know the patient has ovulated, okay? Uh, so those are the two um, objectives to ovulation mid luteal progesterone and follicular tracking, okay? So what are the other methods you can do to assess ovulation, which are not that, uh, not that uh, um, reliable? Anyone? Sometimes patients can use this. Um, they can use LH kits uh, at home using like urine LH measuring urine LH levels. Uh, so which uh, tallies with the LH surge uh, before the ovulation and also temperature charts. So th those are not, not so reliable. So those are not things you would do um, as a doctor, but most of the time some patients do these things. So you would have to know um, how reliable they are, okay? Egg reserve, is it important? Um, so as I see, the egg reserve is quite important. Uh, if someone is uh, to undergo uh, IVF, uh, but for ovulation induction and IUI, it's not so much. If the patient is ovulating, this is not something you would do. But uh, for an, an ovulatory patient, uh, you might assess the egg reserve as well, okay? So um, if someone is having longer cycles, you would like to do FSH level, LH level, you would like to do that around day one to day five of a period. As I told you in the beginning, that's the period where you can get as, have a baseline assessment. You always do it with the estrogen levels because as I told you, estrogen can give a negative feedback on the pituitary. So sometimes you can get falsely low FSH levels with high estrogen levels. So that's why you always do the FSH levels along with the estradiol level, um, TSH, and then if patient has um, features suggestive of polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, you can, even if the patient does not have a CTSM, you can assess for biochemical uh, androgenism using testosterone levels, okay? and cater your investigations uh, toward, towards any other symptoms the patient has. Um, if some, um, so I mean, TSH is um, always done. Um, even if the patient, a patient is ovulating, you tend to do a TSH levels because sometimes they can have subclinical hypothyroidism, uh, which we treat in, an, uh, in a patient with infertility, okay? Um, so how do you assess the fallopian tubes? Anyone? HSG. Mm -hmm. and? and? And laparoscopy. All right, so how do you decide uh, which one, which test to do? Whether to go ahead with the HSG or a laparoscopy? What factors you would consider when deciding which one to go with? Madam, uh, we'll consider laparoscopy if uh, we, uh, we expect other pelvic pathologies to be present as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, in uh, uh, HSD, we can give if patient is not having comorbidities mm -hmm. or any, any other suspicious <laughs> like ectopic pregnancy or uh, endometriosis. Yeah. 
Yeah, so during, very good. So during laparoscopy, you can see and treat. So if you suspect any pathology, you tend to go ahead with the laparoscopy. If not, you can do HSG. Um, the advantages of uh, HSG is uh, you can uh, do it as an outpatient procedure, um, day case, um, doesn't need anesthesia. So if the patient has medical comorbidities, um, they are, the patient cannot ha have, a gen have general anesthesia, you can do HSG. Um, but if you um, need to treat at the same time, you go ahead with the laparoscopy. Uterus and endometrium, how do you assess? <clears throat> yes, anyone? Hysteroscopy. What about a transgenital scan? You people are quite posh now, straight away going ahead with the hysteroscopy. Anyway. Um, yes, you can use hysteroscopy to assess endometrium. So don't get disheartened. That was a correct answer. But you tend to do an ultrasound first. And if you have any abnormalities, you can go ahead with the hysteroscopy to assess, assess the endometrium. Uh, but transvaginal ultrasound scan is the easiest and uh, easiest way to assess the uh, womb and the um, endometrium. Okay, very good. So you all are not sleeping yet. Nice to know. No, why isn't okay? So, based on um, these investigations, you can categorize a couple as having male factor infertility, anovulatory infertility, tubal factor infertility or unexplained infertility. If the semen analysis is normal um, and the patient is ovulating, fallopian tubes are normal, scan is normal, you call it unexplained infertility. If there's anything abnormal in the sperm test, you call it male factor infertility. Anything abnormal with the tubes, you call it tubal problem. And then, um, yeah, so, um, and sometimes if you have problems uh, with the male investigations and the female both, you call it <coughs> a combined cause for the infertility. So then you plan your management according to the type of infertility. So we'll look at some case scenarios now. All right. So we have a 27 year old female who presented with inability to conceive for two years despite regular unprotected intercourse. So when you're taking a history, always remember, sometimes some people come uh, telling, um, doctor, I can't conceive. I have been trying for two years, uh, but if you dig into the history, they will say, oh, I haven't ever had intercourse before. So uh, they might be having vaginismus, um, they might be having erectile dysfunction. So you have to establish its infertility. If that's the case, you just have to treat those conditions. It's not infertility, okay? So this uh, woman has been trying um, for two years and she gives a history of irregular periods with having around two periods a year. Now, are you going to do a mid luteal progesterone in this one? Anyone? No, okay? You, you can think this patient is not ovulating because she just have two periods a year, okay? She also um, gives a history of acne and facial hair. She doesn't have any significant medical history. Her partner is fit and healthy. Now, you all tell me what investigations you would do, want to do in this couple. Okay, start shooting the answers. Are you sleeping? Anyone? What investigations you would want to do? <clears throat> uh, Madam, since there's a picture of a yeah. uh, polycystic uh, uh, ovarian disease, madam, I would like to uh, 
do the non-invasive uh, investigations such as uh, uh, transabdominal ultrasound scan to check with uh, the ovaries, maybe? Yes, very good. So, um, ultrasound done. Um, it shows um, endometrial thickness of seven millimeters. Bilateral ovaries appear polycystic. What else do you need? So someone has said blood investigations, FSH LH ratio. So you can do FSH LH in this patient because she's anovulatory. You need to know where the problem is. Okay. Um, so FSH LH ratio sometimes gives you an idea um, about polycystic ovary syndrome where you have high LH levels. Um, another one has um, given an answer, seminal fluid analysis, very good. Seminal fluid analysis is normal. Ultrasound ovaries, polycystic ovaries, uh, FSH LH, testosterone, okay. Testosterone levels are slightly elevated. Um, the cutoff is 1.7. The patient had a level of 1.8. Androgen levels again, yes. Thyroid function, normal. Biochemical evidence of hyperandrogenism, yes, good. Metabolic screening of patient, yes, good. PSH, okay, very good. So you have done all the investigations you need now, okay. Let's move on to the next side. So examination, what's the most important thing here? BMI, okay? And then you look for hirsutism and all those features for polycystic ovarian syndrome. This is a patient with an ovulation. So you should look for causes starting from your hypothalamus, pituitary, ovaries. So look for all the causes as you look for a patient with amenorrhea, okay? Investigations, as I told you, FSH5, normal, LH11, so a little bit high, like LH to FSH ratio. Uh, LH57, that's a blood test for egg reserve. So people with polycystic ovarian syndrome, they have quite good levels or high levels of AMH. TSH normal, testosterone slightly elevated, ultrasound bilateral polycystic ovaries, um, semen analysis normal. Now, her BMI is 25. How are you going to manage this patient? <clears throat> manage this couple? <clears throat> yes, anyone? Okay, someone wanted to know the prolactin levels. Yes, that's a good one. Um, you can do prolactin levels because she's anovulatory. Um, it's normal in this patient. Sometimes people with polycystic ovarian syndrome can have slightly raised prolactin levels. Um, and you don't investigate this further unless uh, they have symptoms suggestive of high prolactin levels or um, the levels are about 1,000, okay? So, Narmada. Lifestyle modifications, dietary modifications, regular exercise, good. Uh, medical nutrition therapy, if BMI is high, advice, BMI normal in this patient, advice on weight reduction. So that's the first thing. If a patient has a high BMI, you always ask them to reduce the weight before starting treatment. All right, very good. Um, M14123 ovulation induction. So that's the answer I was looking for. Um, so how do you do ovulation induction in this patient? So she has not undergone any treatment before. This is the first time she's presented to you. What drugs you can use in this patient? So ha have you heard about three categories of anovulation, WHO categories, WHO type one, anyone? What are the three types of anovulation according to WHO categories? Yes, M14123, go on, three types. What are the three types? Hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, which is type one, okay? In that case, what would you see in investigations? Low FSH, low LH, low estrogen levels. Type two is polycystic ovarian syndrome, ovarian causes. Type three is premature ovarian failure. So this patient is having very good. 
Very good. M14167, very good. Um, so this patient is having type 2 and ovulation. So you can induce ovulation using oral drugs. So what are the oral um, ovulation induction agents you know? We have already got some answers. Letrozole, very good. Aromatase inhibitor and clomiphene citrate. So those are the most common ovulation induction drugs you can use. So, I mean, both have its uh, ups and downs. Clomiphene citrate, um, uh, how does it work? Anyone can you tell me how clomiphene citrate works? <clears throat> So what is clomiphene citrate? It's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. What does it do? It acts on the pituitary, um, telling the FSH receptors, okay, we don't have enough estrogen in the system. So you need to increase the FSH secretion. So which gives rise to high FSH levels, which um, kickstart the ovary um, to produce a dominant follicle. Okay, um, so the main disadvantage of clomiphene citrate is that uh, it has a negative effect on the endometrium because it's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. Sometimes it can uh, make the endometrium thin, um, which tends to increase with the higher dose. Okay, so what you do is you start with a 50 milligram dose. Starting on day two, you can give that up to five days uh, from day two to day six. And then you can um, trigger the ovulation around uh, the time of ovulation. Or you sometimes the patient just ovulates. You don't have to give a trigger itself. Uh, but if you want to make sure the patient ovulates, you can give a trigger injection. Oh, um, so uh, you have to know the side effects of clomiphene. Okay, what are the complications? So you always have to um, counsel the patients about complications such as multiple pregnancy. A risk of ovarian hyperstimulation is very low with oral agents, it's high with um, injections, um, gonadotrophin injections, but it's quite low with promifin tablets or letrozole tablets. And then you can have, what are the side effects, children, students, someone? Yes, let me see. Okay, I'm seeing your answers now. So side effects, they can get visual disturbances, hot flushes, okay? So someone has G, uh, told um, GNRH analog. So GNRH analog is not something we use to um, induce ovulation, okay? It's a gonadotrophins. GnRH is gonadotrophin releasing hormone, which is secreted by the hypothalamus. Um, and it's very difficult to use as an ovulation induction treatment. If you can remember the menstrual cycle, uh, the GnRH is released in a pulsatile manner. So you have to give them as a pulsatile manner, which is very difficult. So that's not um, used uh, for ovulation induction. Gonadotrophins are used, but that's not the first line in this patient. Why? Because she never had any um, treatment before. Oral agents are quite easy to use and they are cheap, whereas the cost of one gonadotrophin injection is around 1,000 rupees. So that's not the first line. And the side effects are high, um, such as ovarian hyperstimulation and, uh, and uh, multiple pregnancy. So. M15131, Madam Clomiphene citrate, is it 50 milligram or 100 milligram? So what you do is you start with the lowest dose, 50 milligram daily for five days. And if the patient um, doesn't ovulate with that, how would you know the patient is not ovulating with 50 milligram? The patient will not get a period um, unless you um, induce a... So... Uh, so what you do is you start with 50 milligram 
you go on increasing the dose uh, by 50 milligram um, up to 150. That is uh, the highest dose you can give. Um, after that, the side effects uh, are more than the benefits, okay? Okay, now we're in hyperstimulation. Um, it's a rare uh, complication of uh, clomiphene citrate, but you always have to uh, um, counsel the patient about this. Okay, um, letrozole the, uh, is the other option. Okay, so what is letrozole? It's a aromatase inhibitor. And you can start with a 2.5 milligram um, dose. You can increase the dose up to 7.5 milligram daily um, by each cycle until the patient ovulates, okay? Um, so those two are your options. So you can do ovulation induction uh, for three cycles in this patient. Um, patient has ovulated and, ovulated and still not pregnant. Now, as you see, I do a tube assessment uh, in the beginning for this patient, okay? Because she didn't have any risk factors. Now, if the patient did not conceive after three cycles, you can think of doing the HSG. Mm, and uh, if that's normal, you can do a further three cycles of ovulation induction with the same drug. If the patient has ovulated, you don't need to change the dose or anything, okay? So you can go up to six to 12 cycles of ovulation induction, but you don't uh, do it more than 12 cycles, um, then you move on to the next step, uh, which would be IVF. Uh, but imagine if the patient uh, did not ovulate with clomiphene citrate, the highest dose, what would it be the next option? Anyone? <clears throat> you can use gonadotrophin injections now. That's the next step. Very good. M15131. Okay. Yes, that's the next step. So again, um, you can start with the lower dose, um, which is called the step-up regime. So you can start with uh, 75 international units um, of FSH injections, which are taken daily. Um, okay, very interesting. I like your answers. This session is quite interesting. I'm enjoying this lecture. Okay, um, so we'll talk about FSH first. Um, so you go on um, giving uh, FSH in injections daily until, you, until the patient um, gets a dominant follicle of good size. So with the clomiphene citrate, you don't have to always scan the patient, but if you, if you want to, you can. Um, because the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation is quite low. You can scan the patient just with the first cycle. Uh, and if you're not changing the dose, you don't have to always scan. But with FSH injections, you have to always scan the patient because the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation is high. You need to know how many follicles are there before giving the trigger injection. So if there are more than three follicles, you don't give a trigger injection because the risk of multiple pregnancy is high. Okay, um, so you go on giving the injection daily until a patient gets a follicle about 16 millimeters, and then you can give the HCG injection or, or orbitral injection, which is the trigger injection. Um, so as you can see, if you can remember the ovarian cycle, you get the LH surge in the beginning, um, in the middle, uh, which triggers the ovulation. That's what we mimic with the uh, trigger injection. OHCG, okay? So someone has, um, okay, M15131. Madam, is it important to give HCG after FSH and letrozole treatment? Letrozole, you don't have to always give HCG, uh, but FSH injections, again, the patient can ovulate on, on, on her own, um, but FSH injections are quite costly. Uh, you need to make sure you can't, uh, it's easy to monitor. You just uh, give the trigger injection um, after the after you see a dominant follicle. So you um, time the um, intercourse around that time. Uh, with letrozole, you can just ask the patient, you expect the patient to ovulate around day 14. You expect, the, you ask the patient to have intercourse around that time, uh, but it's totally, um, it's a combined decision with the patient and the physician. 
um, sometimes there are people who cannot afford a HCG injection in Sri Lanka. It costs around, I think it's around 5,000 rupees, right, Dr. Kihan? FSH? Uh, HCG. Are we HCG, trailing? you know, HCG is uh, less than 2,000, no? Okay, so I mean, there are so people. 5,000. 5,000 IU uh, will be around 2,000 rupees. 2,000, so there, but still there are people who cannot afford that. So it, it, it's uh, always you should cater according to the patient. It's not essential, okay? Uh, so Sama, Udaya Kumar, ovarian drilling. Okay, so I, um, as a person who's doing fertility, this is not something we like, okay? Uh, it's an option. Uh, but um, should be borne in mind as the last resort, okay? So because the disadvantages are quite high, if someone is not responding to a ovulation induction with the oral drugs, you can try ovarian drilling, uh, but you have to keep in mind it can affect the egg reserve of the patient. So if at any point if the patient is going to undergo IVF, um, this can result in poor success rate uh, with the IVF. So if you don't have any other option, only you would consider this. And also you can get peritubal additions and other complications during ovarian drilling. So never give this as your first answer in a patient with an ovulation. Okay. Uh, uh, Inosha? Yeah. Uh, excuse me. I'm giving the word of thanks, Vitaly. <laughs> uh, are you really? getting no, no, oh, okay. I, I have to attend uh, for an emergency. Okay. Uh, right. Thanks. Thank you very much, Inosha. You continue the discussion and the rest of your lecture. Uh, thank you very much for taking all the trouble and accepting my invitation uh, to serve the, you know, the your para faculty and the, the all the, the, uh, the, the students. And I must thank the participants as well. And you carry on with Dr. Inosha. Uh, and uh, till she finishes the lecture. You can ask any questions, clarifications, MCQs, SBAs, true, false, or long cases, whatever. Okay. Thank you. Right. I'm Thank leaving you very energy. much. Okay. okay. And thanks for the invitation. <laughs> okay. Now, um, understood. So, can you, uh, are you okay to do ovulation? So, as, Students and house officers, you are not going to do these things, but you have to know how these things happen. Um, so you can advise patients accordingly, okay? Um, so there's a nice question. How can we assess hyperstimulation of FSH treatment, madam? So uh, as I told you, um, always you do scans uh, when you're doing FSH injections. So um, symptoms, patient could feel bloated, um, nauseated, uh, and during um, the scan, if you see uh, more than three follicles, you don't give the trigger injection and you ask the patient to avoid intercourse as well. Um, and what happens is when you do the scan, you see lots of follicles. Um, and uh, I mean, the typical hyperstimulations uh, like you see, you know, IVF doesn't happen, but happen, but you can see a lot of follicles uh, in both ovaries. It's some fluid accumulation in, around the ovaries, okay? Um, hey, Rath. Um, madam, do we use OCP as a treatment for polycystic ovarian syndrome? What is the rationale? Do they get regular periods by OCP? So OCP, um, you don't use, uh, you can't use contraceptives as treatment option uh, in fertility unless you want to induce a bleed. Um, so people with polycystic ovarian syndrome, because they don't get periods, you can induce a period before starting ovulation induction um, using a noitistron, or else um, you can give or combine oral contraceptive pill and after stop for a month, and after stopping that, they, give, they get a period. Uh, the easiest way is to give noitistron for about seven days. Um, to induce a bleed, okay? Next patient, 32-year-old <clears throat> female, 
uh, presented with infertility for two years. She gives a history of pituitary surgery followed by radiotherapy. She's currently on hormone replacement therapy and thyroxine. She doesn't have any other medical problems. Her partner is fit and healthy. All right, what investigations you want to carry out, students? Anyone? So what is the most likely cause of um, infertility here? Sleeping? Maybe the thyroid disease uh, contributed to the infertility in this patient. Um, yeah. Okay, she gives a history of uh, pituitary surgery followed by radiotherapy and she's on a charty. Why do you think she's on a charty? Yes. <clears throat> Why is she on thyroid? So, I mean, it can have an effect, but she's on thyroxine replacement therapy. That means the thyroid problem is controlled. So she's having, most probably she's having hypo. So when you have a history like this, your mind should automatically think, okay, this patient can have hypopituitarism, must be having hypopituitarism. That's why she's on thyroxine replacement therapy. That's why she's on home replacement therapy, okay? Very good. Um, so lots of people have given the answer, WHO class one, pituitary dysfunction, hypopituitarism due to radiotherapy. Yes, very good. Um, and what was the name, Puta? The one who gave the oral answer? Uh, I'm, I'm Shehan, man. Okay, which year are you from? I'm finally, man. All right, very good. I mean, you, you have to try, otherwise you won't learn, okay? It's very good to uh, give answers. Then only know um, how to learn from your answers, okay? So you have to think, patient is on replacement therapy uh, for thyroxine. Um, that means that is controlled. Um, you have to think why the patient is hormone replacement therapy because she's having hypopituitarism most probably, okay? So what investigations would you want to do, anyone? Yes, yes. SHLH levels, man. Very good. If SHLH levels done, both are low. Anything else? Prolactin, okay. Normal. <clears throat> what else you want to know? It's a couple. Estrogen, okay, you do FSHLH along with estrogen. So estrogen levels are normal, seminal fluid analysis. So those are the only things you need. I mean, you have to exclude other medical problems and everything according to the other history. So semen analysis, normal, FSH 0.5, low, LH 0.4, low, estradiol 200. So in hypopituitarism, what would you expect the estrogen levels to be? So this, is, this estrogen level is normal. What would you expect it to be? Low, very good, M14123. So why is this normal then? Due because to hormone replacement therapy. Yes, very good. So uh, ultrasound, uterus normal. Bilateral ovaries are not visualized. So people with hypopituitarism, if they had it for a long time, you usually when you scan them, you don't see their ovaries. It's quite difficult to visualize. Their ovaries are shrunken, but you can stimulate uh, their ovaries using um, um, drugs. Okay, very good. Um, so how would you manage this patient now? So what is it? WHO type 1 and ovulatory infertility. Semen analysis is normal, so you can do ovulation induction. What agents you can use here? Comiblin citrate. Very good. 
That's the answer I expect. Now, can you use clomiphene citrate here? My answer is no. Why can't you use? Because the patient's pituitary is not working. So the patient cannot uh, secrete FSH and LH um, by herself, okay? So you can't use uh, clomiphene citrate and letrozole for a patient with WHO type 1 anovulation. Okay, yes, very good. M14167, very good. M14123, very good. M15, good. M14178, 171, were you sleeping? I told you no GNRH analogs to stimulate ovulation. It's going to be very difficult because if you are using GNRH analog, you have to give them in a pulsatile manner. And then you have to use a pump, which is um, not available. Okay, so that's not an answer you are going to use, okay? IV FSH, FSH is not given as IV injections. Those are given as subcutaneous injections. FSH 75 international units, M14, M15131, very good. So yeah, so the only option here then is gonadotrophin injections, okay? Um, so very good, you use FSH injections. Uh, because this patient is having hypopituitarism, um, she's not secreting LH as well. So you would uh, tend to use a uh, combined gonadotrophins, uh, gonadotrophin, which contains both uh, LH and FSH in this case, because um, for the ovulation and for the proper maturation of uh, oocyte, you need some amount of LH as well. So you can use combined preparation. Um, uh, which contains both LH and FSH. So you again give the injections daily, okay? So you start with 75 international units subcutaneous injections daily, um, and you can continue that for about two weeks. I mean, this is not at your level. Um, what you would do is, if, if you get a patient like this, what you have to say, um, I would refer this patient uh, for specialized management for a, in a, for, to a fertility unit. Um, and the most uh, probable option of management here uh, would be um, gonadotrophin injections, okay? How you do it is you give, um, you use a step-up uh, protocol. Um, so you, you start with the lowest dose, go on increasing it uh, weekly till a patient develops a follicle. And do you have to give a trigger injection in this patient? Definitely. Because unlike in other, uh, the polycystic ovarian syndrome patient, this patient um, can't um, have a LH surge by herself. You need to, yes, very good, M14123, very good. Um, so she doesn't have any LH, so you have to trigger the ovulation uh, with the uh, HCG injections in this patient, okay? Um, so that's how you do ovulation induction in this patient. Again, um, you, um, you can, uh, now in this case scenario, you can do the uh, tubal patency test in the beginning. You can argue both ways. You can say, okay, the patient does not have any risk factors uh, for tubal problems. Um, so I would uh, do ovulation induction, and if the patient is unable to conceive after three cycles, I would assess the tubes. But having said that, FSH injections are quite costly. So you can do the HSG in the beginning and then um, start ovulation induction. So you can argue both ways. It's not uh, hard and fast. You always have to cater according to your patient's needs. Um, and it's a as long as you are treating the um, course um, and you are not killing the patient, it's always you can have your say, okay? Um, so in this patient, it has to be gondotrophin injections. Um, and then you can go up to six cycles or 12 cycles, usually after six cycles. If the patient is not conceiving, um, you advise them on um, IVF, okay? <clears throat> Next one, 35. 
Um, so M14, madam, what is the action of HCG in these patients as I am, are you meaning that are we giving this as I am injection? It depends on the preparation. Um, so there are recombinant um, HCG injections, um, um, so different kinds of HCG preparation. You can give them a subcutaneous OIM as both, okay? Depends on the preparation, all right? 35-year-old female presented with fertility wishes. She has recently started planning for a family. However, she gives a history of amenorrhea for one year with menopausal symptoms. She has undergone multiple surgeries, for bilateral ovarian cysts in the past. The partner is fit and healthy. Okay, investigation students should What would you like to do in this patient? We can start with the seminal fluid analysis. Very good. Then uh, this female has uh, risk factors for the tubal patency and the pelvic diseases because she has uh, undergone multiple surgeries. So we have mm -hmm. to assess the tubal patency before right. starting. Very good. Uh, what else do you want to do? What's the main problem here? Has she got ovarian failure here? Mm -hmm. okay. So that's the most probable cause. So um, the first person who gave the answer, what's your name, Puta? Rakesh, madam. Rakesh, okay. Rakesh, very good. You have given the answer, but don't forget the main, main problem here, okay? Don't keep that in, you know you knew that, but you kept that in the back of your mind. You always have to talk in your exam. Um, you can't keep things in, your, in the back of your mind. So you know this patient is having amenorrhea. That's the first thing you need to investigate uh, before moving to um, tubal factor, okay? So you have to tackle that first, and then you can talk about tubal factor um, as well, okay? So that you have to think about the, you can't um, keep the um, tastiest thing for the last. You have to give them in the first place, okay? Give that in the first place. Yes, the next person, yes. Um, yes, the patient is uh, most probably having premature ovarian failure, which is suggestive from her history. So what investigations, what, what, what do you think the investigations would show? Would you do FSH and LH levels in this patient? Would you do them? I'll see, let's see the answers. <clears throat> Premature ovarian failure, no AMH. Yes, AMH is a good option. You can do FSHLH as well because those would be raised in premature ovarian failure. AMH, lap and die, and hormone profile, yes. AMH, AMH, FSHLH increase. And also, the other thing you have to uh, remember um, when you say you would do a laparoscopy and dye test in a patient uh, who has risk factors for tubal problem, you always have to think about the risks as well. So if this patient has undergone multiple um, surgeries in the past for bilateral ovarian cyst, uh, if there's a midline scar, several scars, um, I wouldn't want to do a laparoscopy and dye test in this patient because the risk of a bowel injury would be quite high, okay? Um, and, the, and it's not going to help with my management. If the patient has premature ovarian failure, um, there's no way you are going to do any uh, treatment using your own eggs in this patient. Um, so there's no point do a, doing a tubal patent test to check uh, whether she can conceive naturally. Um, so no, I, would, I wouldn't say I would do a laparoscopy and dye test for this patient. So you all ha always have to think when you're investigating, is this investigation going to help my management, okay? <clears throat> IVF, okay. So, investigations. FSH of 75, which is quite high. LH 50, high. Estradiol, less than five, quite low. AMH less than 0.5, again, quite low. So the patient is having WHO type 3 and ovulatory um, dysfunction. She's having premature ovarian failure, most probably 
due to reduced egg reserve after multiple surgeries. Scan revealed the uterus um, and ovaries not, were not visualized as expected, semen analysis normal. So how would you tackle this couple now? So what's the best investigation in this patient, Madam M14123? So you would want to know first uh, whether the patient is, so you suspect premature ovarian failure here. So you do investigations to confirm your diagnosis. FSH, LH, estradiol. She has perimenopausal symptoms. So you can confirm the diagnosis here. Um, and then when you get a patient with premature ovarian failure, um, the only option would be, what's the option? What's the treatment option here? IVF with donor eggs, okay? Um, ovum donation, very good. M14, 171, 123. Uh, yeah, a lot of people have given the correct answer, okay? So it's, uh, it's going to be IVF uh, using donor eggs. So when you are doing IVF using donor eggs, what you would be doing um, is taking someone else's eggs, combine them with her partner's sperms, and put the embryo back inside the womb. So you don't need to assess tubal patents in this patient uh, because it's not going to matter unless uh, the patient, uh, unless the scan shows hydrosalkin Gs, uh, which can affect the success, success rate um, of uh, of an IVF, so you can do an ultrasound, uh, but you don't straight away go and do a tubal. So, so I think um, your brains are filled. Uh, if you are getting a patient with infertility, you have to do these investigations, uh, um, all these investigations. So it's not like that. You always have to cater to the patient, okay? Go according to your history and examination and I'll give your case here, okay? Um, so you don't need a tubal patency in this patient because you are straight away putting the embryo back inside the womb and you don't need fallopian tubes for this patient to conceive because she's not going to conceive with her own eggs, okay? Semen analysis is essential because if, if she's going for donate treatment, um, that is needed. Uh, but again, if she's going to give up treatment, if she, you just give her the options first. Um, this, these are your chances and this is the way you can conceive. And if she's not uh, planning any further treatment, you don't even need a semen analysis in this case, right? Um, okay, questions. M15. Madam, what is the reason for reduction in egg reserve in a patient who has undergone a number of surgeries? That's a very good question. So if a patient has undergone multiple surgeries for removal of ovarian cysts, if uh, someone has very big cyst, when you do the cystectomy, sometimes you realize that there's not, no remaining not normal ovarian tissue, okay? So when, you when they undergo so many surgeries, the egg reserve tends to go down because each time you remove a cyst, some amount of normal ovarian tissue also can get damaged. And also when you diatomize, ovarian tissue can get damaged. Um, uh, and then, um, so that's why people with endometriosis, um, even when they have endometriomas, you ask them to have a fertility treatment first, um, rather than going ahead with a cystectomy, because that can damage um, some amount of normal ovarian tissue. So the best option uh, in a patient with endometriosis, unless they are having very big cyst, uh, uh, like if we cannot do the egg collection with, with a very big cyst, um, but if they're having small cysts, you advise them to have IVF first if they can afford it, uh, rather than going ahead with the surgery for cystectomy. Do we need to find a cause for premature ovarian failure, madam? Yes, very good. So that, that would be your case discussion here. So you have to, um, in your history, uh, you have to find the main complaint of this patient. So if she presented, um, with just amenorrhea, um, you would discuss in detail about that. But if she presented with uh, inability to conceive, you discuss about her fertility problem first, and then you go on um, telling. You have to have a holistic approach towards a patient. 
So you have to tell, okay, we might need to assess why this, uh, oh, sorry. In this particular patient, uh, probably not because her history gives a, a clue that um, she has had multiple surgeries. So probably not, uh, but you can mention that, okay. Um, let's see another question. Madam, can we reverse premature ovarian failure? Usually not. Um, no, at your level, I would say no, okay? Uh, what else? Did I miss some questions? Can IVF end up with an ectopic pregnancy in tuber problem? Yes. So um, as with the natural pregnancy, IVF also can give rise to ectopic pregnancy, not, uh, in a, not only in a patient with tubal problems, even in a patient who doesn't have any tubal problems at all, um, because we are putting the embryo uh, inside the womb, and sometimes the embryo can migrate upwards and result in an ectopic pregnancy, okay? So it's not due to the tubal problem itself, it's uh, due to embryo migration and implantation um, in a tube, okay? Um, why people have um, with hydrosalpinges could have low success rate with IVF is that um, the fluid that accumulates inside the hydrosalpinges um, can drip back towards the endometrium and can be toxic to an uh, implanting embryo, em embryo okay? I don't know whether I have missed some questions. Uh, so wait a minute. Madam, in this patient, can't we do a cryopreservation of OVA before undergoing multiple cystectomies? Yes, that is possible. If you if we so that is something you always to have I always have to discuss. Um, in a patient, uh, if someone is um, going to have uh, surgeries that um, can reduce their egg reserve, uh, such as, um, I mean, that is possible, but uh, it's not always expected. You, you don't deliberately do it, um, but that's all, always something you need to discuss with the patient before you undertake a surgery, okay? Um, especially a patient in reproductive age. Uh, I think I miss. <clears throat> I think I missed one question. Uh, Madam, is it important to do self injectomy before IVF in the patient with hydrosalpine cheese? Um, again, it depends. Um, if you can do it, that's the best. But sometimes, you know, I have seen patients, um, for example, I have seen a patient uh, who has Crohn's disease. She had multiple surgeries in the past. She had a stoma um, and uh, you wouldn't want to even go do another surgery on herself because the risk of bowel damage is quite high. Um, so, I mean, you always have to weigh the risks and benefits. If it's possible, that's the best option. But if it endangers life, you wouldn't want to do that, okay? Um, so it is known to reduce the success rate, but it's not zero. So you can go ahead uh, with IVF in a patient with hydrosalpinges if, the, if it's too risky, risky to undertake a surgery uh, in that patient, okay? Very good, I'm enjoying this lecture. The number of participants are going down. Is it, is it bedtime there? <laughs> All right. So as we discussed, if it's an ovulation, you can do ovulation induction if the semen analysis is normal and there's no any other fertility uh, problem. Tubal factor. Um, so it's... IVF versus tubal surgery. As you all know, we don't have IVF in the government sector in Sri Lanka um, and tubal surgery. Sometimes uh, you can do tubal surgery in the government sector, uh, by, but you need skills. Um, and also if there's no point doing a tubal surgery in, already in an already damaged tube, 
for example, if it's a in large hydrosulfanes um, and you just um, do a tuber reconstruction, it's going to fill up again. Uh, but sometimes in a, if patient if a patient is having proximal tubal blocks at the cornua, you can do tuber, something called tubal cannulation. Most of the time, this happens due to like debris getting stuck um, uh, in tubes. So you can do a cannula, um, put a cannula, small cannula through uh, the tube and make it patent. So it's not impossible. And also if someone has LRT, you can reverse. Um, so those things are possible. So if someone is having tubal factor problem, the most uh, uh, effective way would be IVF, uh, but tubal surgery is also an option. Unexplained, um, you can do, uh, sorry, this, is, this should be ovulation induction plus IUI or IVF, okay? Um, again, uh, the, best op the best option would be IVF, but we don't have it um, in Sri Lanka. Ovulation induction and IUI, um, three cycles of ovulation induction and IUI gives the same success rate as IVF. Um, so you can do both depending on the patient circumstances. Male factor, you have to decide. Um, so if the sperm concentration is around um, more than 10 million per milliliter, you can consider IUI. Uh, but the best again is IVF, okay? Uh, there's another question. In case of infertility with endometriosis, if we treat with progesterone or OCP, that will cause infertility itself. So the management is directly go for surgical management, yes. So in a patient with infertility and endometriosis, if you get a case like that, uh, you have to identify which is the biggest problem for the patient, whether that's the pain or infertility. So if it's the pain um, and patient has fertility wishes, the only option is going to be surgery um, or if, if the pain, patient can tolerate pain till she undergoes one cycle of IVF, you can under, counsel her towards IVF. But you cannot give hormonal uh, treatment uh, if a patient has fertility wishes, um, um, unless patient cannot afford IVF. Um, so it's surgical option in, in a case like that, okay? <clears throat> Next slide. Is that the end of my slideshow? Yes. Shall we discuss some? MCQs now. Let me see. Any questions so far before we begin the MCQs? Okay, can you see uh, my slideshow? Sorry? Yes, madam. Okay, all right. Um, so the first question, I think we are covering a lot of um, male factor problems with the MCQs. So the best, uh, to, best test to dis determine occurrence of ovulation is or type your answers or give your answers. Um, alteration in the consistency of cervical mucus, biphasic changes in the temperature chart, detection of a rise in the plasma LH level at mid cycle, elevation of plasma progesterone levels in the mid luteal phase, occurrence of a plasma estradiol peak at mid cycle. Let's see your answers. T, very good. All right, very good. All of you are answering correct. So alteration of consistency of cervical mucus, it's a method, but not, not reliable. 
biphasic changes in temperature chart possible not reliable detection of a rise in plasma lh level cumbersome not something done quite commonly but it's again possible elevation um, and you can do urine lh as well using lh kits elevation of the plasma progesterone levels in the mid luteal phase yes that's the correct answer occurrence of a plasma estradiol peak at mid cycle um, it's not going to work uh, because some people might not even have that peak um, people with polycystic ovaries they tend to high, have high estrogen from the beginning of their cycle so that's not possible um, so that's not a good answer Okay, next question. A seminal fluid analysis is performed on the male partner during routine investigation of a couple who have been infertile for one year. Which one of the following values could be a cause of their infertility? Answers, please. Yes, you are on the correct path. You are giving correct answers. So progressive motility, what should be the figure? Have you heard of WHO semen analysis reference uh, value, reference ranges? So uh, you have to know um, these WHO reference ranges, they are just references. It's not called the normal range because uh, all you need is just one uh, to fertilize an egg. Um, uh, if someone doesn't have uh, the semen values um, in the reference range, it doesn't mean that they cannot conceive ever. It means that the, they are, their success of a natural pregnancy is low uh, and they would benefit from treatment. So never say never, okay? So what's the um, value for the progressive mortality? 32%, yes. So basically, when you have a semen analysis, you look at mainly three um, features. You can look at the other ones as well. Okay, four. So you look at the volume. It should be more than 1.3 uh, milliliters. You look at the concentration. The reference uh, value is more than 15 millions per milliliter. You look at the progressive mobility. That should be 32%. You look at the morphology, it should be 4%. So 10% progressive mobility means the sperms are not moving well. So that's the answer. Ejaculatory volume of three is normal. Three to four white blood cells could be normal. 10% normal forms, more than needed, it's 4%. Sperm concentration of 30 millions per milliliter, that's a normal value. You expect a minimum of 15 million. Okay. A man is found to have a sperm concentration of 2 million per milliliter on one occasion. What is the next step in the management? Estimate serum FSH and testosterone levels, perform testicular aspiration, repeat the test in three months, repeat the test in three weeks, test for anti sperm antibodies. Yes, very good. All if you are getting the answer correct. You all are very thorough with your theory, very good. Um, so you repeat the test in three months. So one sperm test, if it's abnormal, it's not conclusive. You always have to confirm it um, by repeating a test after three months. Why? Because one sperm cycle takes three months to complete. Um, so you need to have a um, theoretically have a look at a new batch of sperms, okay? FSH and testosterone level might be the next step uh, if it comes back the same way. Testicular aspiration, you don't need testicular aspiration if you've got sperms in the semen analysis. Uh, repeat test in three months, correct. Three weeks, too, too little time. Test for anti-sperm antibodies, um, that is not something done, okay? 
90 days, yes, very good. <clears throat> a man is found to have azospermia on two separate occasions, three months apart. What is the next step in the management? Now we have confirmed, we have repeated it uh, twice and um, we have confirmed azospermia. So what's the next step? Yes, very good. Everyone is... Um, source. Most have um, say, most say it's A, but some people have said it's D. Now let's look at the answer. So again, um, you see, it's same thing as the anovulation. You have to identify where the problem is. If someone is having azospermia on one sample, you repeat it, uh, you confirm the diagnosis. Okay, now this man is having azospermia. Now you, are, you need to identify where the problem is. So you examine the patient first, okay? Um, during examination, I told you, um, look for features of hypogonadism, Look at the testicular size. If it's small, most probably suggest a testicular cause. Look at the vast difference, whether they are present or not. If they're absent, it could be cystic fibrosis, absent vas. And then you see, you start from the hypothalamus. So it could be hypothalamus pituitary problem. It could be a testicular problem, or it could be obstruction starting from the testicular. Um, testicle coming, out, the sperms are not coming out um, through the spermatic cord. Okay, um, so if so, what you do is next estimate FSH and LH levels. Karyotyping, do you need to do that? So M fifteen one thirty one, can't we check testosterone? Yes, we can. So when you are doing the investigations, you have to do FSH, LH along with the testosterone level. Sometimes you can get a normal testosterone level. So you, you don't know why, because um, you don't know why the patient is having um, normal testosterone level. But if you didn't check your FSH and LH, you would know where the problem is. Sometimes you can have normal testosterone with low LH and FSH. That would suggest the patient is taking exogenous testosterone. If you can remember, you need high concentration of testosterone within your testes uh, for the spermatogenesis to occur. So when you take exogenous testosterone, it gives a negative feedback to your brain um, and your brain thinks, oh, okay, your testicles are producing enough testosterone. So the endogenous testosterone secretion goes down but what you need is endogenous testosterone uh, for sperm production. So you can get a false reassurance if you do just the testosterone levels, okay? So the ideal answer would have been estimate serum FSH LH along with testosterone, but this is the answer which is most near to that, okay? So you take that, the answer is A. <clears throat> Karyotyping, do you have to do? You can do um, before, if you are treating a patient with azospermia, if you are doing a testicular sperm aspiration, you have to do a karyotype before uh, doing that uh, to identify any congenital problems. Testicular biopsy, again, um, in a patient who's expecting fertility treatment, you don't just carry out a testicular biopsy unless you com combine it with the treatment. You can do testicular biopsy if you want to aspirate sperms from there. Testicular aspiration, again, um, if you are treating the patient, test for anti-sperm antibodies, it's not done because there's no treatment for that, okay? So the answer is, because that's the first thing you would do, estimate serum FSH and LH levels to identify where the problem is. If the FSH, LH are, are low and testosterone are low, what's the diagnosis? Anyone? 
FSHLH low, testosterone low. Diagnosis, same as the female. Hypogonadotrophic, hypogonadism. The pituitary and the hypothalamus is not working. Very good, M14, 123, M15, very good. If the FSH, LH normal, testosterone normal, what's the diagnosis? Yes, very good. Can be obstruction or it could be unexplained. Yes, very good. Um, testosterone normal, LH, FSH low, as I told you, exogenous testosterone. Okay. So, someone has asked a question. When a person has taken long-term testosterone therapy, can we reverse the suppressed endogenous testosterone production? Yes, we can. You just have to ask the patient to stop the testosterone and then um, wait for it. It can take more than one year um, for their um, HBO axis to come back to normal. You can reverse it, okay? <clears throat> All right. Uh, next question. A man is found to have... When am I supposed to um, end this lecture? Anyone? Are you feeling sleepy? Have you had enough? Do you want me to stop or do you want me to carry on? Am I behind the clock? Anyone? Do you want um, more? Normally we can finish, finish this off. Right? No All right. Okay. Have you got any other plans tonight? Apart from sleeping, no. <laughs> then we can carry on. Okay. A man is found to have a um, sperm concentration of two million per milliliter on two separate occasions, um, three months apart. <clears throat> so what is this? Oligosuspermia. Yeah. Serum L FSH and LH levels are in the low normal range. MRI scan of the pituitary foci is normal. The woman has 28 day regular cycles. Investigations reveal regular ovulation and patent tubes. What is the next step of management? IVF, IUI with aspirated sperms, IUI with donor sperm, treat with clomiphene citrate, treat with human gonadotrophin injections. What's your answer? Okay, lots of different answers. Advice IVF. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be the best option if you were working in a country like this, that would be the first line option. But you have to think, you are still working in Sri Lanka. A lot of people cannot afford um, IVF. You, so you have to utilize whatever you have there, okay? So let's keep that aside. And then let's look at the second one. Perform artificial insemination with aspirated sperms. <clears throat> you don't need aspirated sperms when you have sperms um, in the ejaculate. So that's wrong. Perform artificial insemination with donor sperm. No, um, he still has some sperms. So you, you don't have to think about donors yet, okay? Treat with clomiphene citrate, hmm, that can work. Uh, treat with HCG injections. I mean, it says FSH, LH are in the low normal range. So, I mean, sometimes you are true. People have given that answer. You have a point. Sometimes in hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, they can have FSH, LH in the low normal range. Um, but the answer they expect here is clomiphene citrate um, because if the LH, LH, FSH, LH are normal and they are in the lower range, you can try to increase the FSH secretion using clomiphene citrate. It acts on the similar way, um, like it works on the female. 
um, makes the pituitary think uh, uh, in a way to increase the FSH secretion. So they, that's the answer here. Um, IVF, this in, in a setting like United Kingdom, that, that's the answer. But in Sri Lanka, that's not the first option because you don't you can't offer it in the government sector. Okay. <clears throat> Tamoxifen can be used. Yes, possible. Not commonly used, but it's possible. It's another um, estrogen receptor mod modulator. But the most commonly used one is clomiphene citrate. Okay. Uh, it's a controversial question. Um, I got these MCQs from Dr. Gihan. Um, so, yeah, it's a controversial question. A man is found to have a sperm concentration of 2 million sperm ml, serum FSH and LH levels are low. Now, this is hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism if the testosterone is also low. MRI uh, of the pituitary normal, sperm concentration improves to 4 million per milliliter after treatment with clomiphene citrate. So that's what they have done. Woman has 28 day regular cycles. Investigations reveal regular ovulation and patent tubes. Okay, so it's male factor infertility. What is the most appropriate next step in the management? Now they have um, done used clomiphene citrate. Um, the concentration has improved up to 4 million. Now, what's your plan? Some say B, some say D. Let's see. Advice IVF. Okay, let's keep that aside. Perform artificial insemination with prepared sperms. Perform artificial insemination with donor sperms. Treat with HCG followed by FSH injection. No, that's a treatment option for hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, not, not for these people, okay? Treat with tamoxifen. I would say IVF. Why? Uh, why not IUI? Because with the sperm concentration less than 5 million, um, the success rate of IUI is going to be very low because the concentration of sperm is going to be very low with the preparation. So IVF is the best option in this case, okay? <clears throat> Next one. The male partner of an infertile couple has a sperm concentration of 10 million per milliliter on two separate occasions, three months apart. Now, this is 10 million compared to the 5 million, 4 million before. The woman has 28 day regular cycles. Investigations reveal regular ovulation and patent tubes. So, what would you do now? Now it's easy to answer, right? I have already given you the answer. A, yes. So, you can do artificial insemination with this sperm concentration. Okay. You don't need donor sperms because it's 10 million. Um, you don't need to aspirate because you have sperms in the ejaculate. You don't need clomiphene citrate because he has a good sperm concentration suitable for IUI. No, don't need gondrophin injections. Okay. An infertile woman has menstruation once in 45 to 60 days. BMI is 22. Serum FSH level, LH levels are in the low normal range. Mid luteal progesterone is eight. Laparoscopy reveals a normal pelvis is with patent tubes. What's the first step in management? Mm -hmm. So what's the problem here? An ovulation. What would you do? <clears throat> Answers. What's the best answer here? Yes, very good. You have been listening to me. Yes. So the answer is C. So perform follicular tracking to determine the time of ovulation. Will you do that? How long are you going to do that? She has 60-day cycles 
And what's the point of doing that? 45 to 60 day means she's not ovulating. Treat with clomiphene citrate and metformin. That's not the first line. You can just use clomiphene citrate. Okay. Sometimes if someone is not responding to clomiphene, if someone is having clomiphene resistance, you can add metformin to that. Uh, but that's not the first line. When you're starting to treat the patient, you can just start off with the clomiphene. Treat with clomiphene citrate and with cycle HCG injections. That's the answer. As I told you, you can decide to use the injection or you can skip it, but that's the answer they have given here. Treat with letrozole. Again, possible. Treat with progestogen in the second half of the cycle. Oh, now whether it's C or D. What would you do? Would you treat with letrozole or would you treat with clomiphene and ovitrail, HCG injections? <clears throat> I'll go with clomiphene and HCG injection that, 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 because that's um, the drug which has been used for a long time. Letrozole is a, still a new drug. Um, Lot of still a lot of files um, to see um, its side effects and complications. And in the past, there has been a paper saying um, letrozole could give rise to congenital abnormalities, but that's not proven. Uh, but in this case, I mean, it has a similar, somewhat similar efficacy, but I would go with clomiphene because it has been used for, for a long time. Okay. <clears throat> Hmm. Infertile woman has menstruation once in every 45 to 60 days, BMI is 22, FSH and LH levels are in the low normal range, progesterone level is 8, laparoscopy reveals normal pelvis with patent tubes, treated with clomiphene citrate followed by FSH injections without success, what's the next step of management? Now I'm going to kill someone if someone gives answer as B. If you were listening to my lecture, you would not give the answer as B. <clears throat> now, M14080, did you just join the lecture? What is GnRH? Gonadotrophin releasing hormone. I told you it's not easy to uh, give positive ad administration of gonadotrophin releasing hormone. Okay, so it's not a it's not used as an ovulation induction agent. It's gonadotrophins, FSH, not gonadotrophin releasing hormone, okay? Uh, so IVF, that would be the option. Laparoscopic ovarian drilling, last resort, not the best option. I think it should be IVF. Pulsatile administration of GnRH, no. If you want to use that, you need a GnRH pump and it's cumbersome. It's not used as an ovulation induction agent. Treat with GnRH inj injections once a month for three months, no. Um, what, do you, what, what happens when you give GnRH injection once a month for three months? It would suppress everything. That's used as a treatment option for endometriosis. Treat with progesterone in the second half of the cycle. That's not even treatment method, okay? <clears throat> All right, next one. 30 year old infertile woman has menstruation once in every 45 to 60 days. The BMI is 30. Transvaginal ultrasound scan reveals polycystic ovaries. 
She was advised on weight reduction and treated with clomiphene for three months without success. What's the next step of management? I think uh, by uh, their meaning, um, she has been treated uh, with clomiphene for three months without success. They are meaning uh, she has not ovulated with the clomiphene here. <clears throat> Yes, very good. So you don't straight away go to IVF here. She still has undergone three cycles of uh, ovulation induction with clomiphene, um, and she has clomiphene resistance uh, because she's not ovulating with clomiphene. Um, then the second option would be um, to add metformin to that. You can do that, okay? Ovarian drilling, again, it's not something we like. You can do it, but um, it's going to affect her future fertility. IVF, not yet. Versatile administration of GnRH, no. If it was gonadotrophins, that would have been the best answer rather than clomiphene and metformin. Gonadotrophins are more effective um, than clomiphene and metformin. Uh, treatment with progesterone, that's not it. Uh, that's not an answer, okay? <clears throat> Hmm. 30-year-old infertile woman has menstruation once in 45 to 60 days, BMI 30, uh, scan reveals polycystic ovaries. She was treated with clomiphene and metformin for three months without success. What's the next step? So she has not ovulated with clomiphene. She has not ovulated with clomiphene plus metformin. What would you do? Very good. The answer is D, you treat with FSH injections. IVF, not yet, because you haven't made her ovulate yet. Okay, after six cycles of ovulation, you can think about uh, IVF, but if she hasn't ovulated, you can still try to make her ovulate using FSH injections. Okay. <clears throat> Next question. A couple who have failed to conceive after two years of unprotected regular intercourse attend the infertility clinic. The woman has 28 day regular periods. They have no other complaints. What is the first step in the investigation of this couple? What's the first thing you would do? Very good, all of you have got it right. Answer is D. Temperature chart, the woman is ovulating, no need. Day 21 progesterone, she has 28 day cycle, she's ovulating. Laparoscopy, that's invasive, that's not the first test you are going to do. Seminal fluid analysis, yes, that's the first step. Ultrasound, I mean, she doesn't give any history of pelvic pathologies. That's a test you would do, uh, but you would do seminal fluid analysis as the first uh, investigation, okay? Very good. 26-year-old woman who has been infertile for two years attends the clinic. She has 28-day regular cycles, day 21 progesterone normal, seminal fluid analysis normal. She has no other complaints. Which of the investigations should be performed next? <clears throat> yes? <clears throat> Answers, please. No one? Okay, lots of different answers. Okay, hydrotubation, 
that's a test to uh, assess fallopian tubes. Not very much commonly used these days um, because you have better tests. So that's not the first time. Uh, the first thing you would do. HSG, yes, because uh, she doesn't have any risk factors given in her history. So to complete the investigation, you can do HSG. Lapanditis, no, because she doesn't have any risk factors. Ultrasound and follicular tracking, you don't need that because you have proven ovulation with day 21 progesterone. So people who have told D, it's wrong. Pubal insufflation, again, um, not used commonly because HSG is better than that, okay? 26-year-old woman who has been infertile for two years attends the clinic. She has frequent periods with dysmenorrhea, which is uh, worst on the third day. She also complains of deep dyspareunia. Day 21 progesterone is normal. Seminal fluid analysis is normal. Which of the following investigations should be performed next? Very good. Everyone is getting it right. It should be laparoscopy and die test. It's the same scenario as before, but this time, the patient has risk factors for tubal problems because she has dysmenorrhea and also she has deep dyspareunia. So you would expect something as like endometriosis or pelvic inflammatory disease in this patient when you do a laparoscopy. So you would do a laparoscopy because you can see and treat at the same time. Uh, that's the end of the... MCQ discussion. So I'm happy to answer any of your questions. At the same time, I would really love it if you could leave a comment about the lecture today. Um, anything good, anything bad, was I too fast, any improvements? Um, and uh, if you want another lecture, what would you want to discuss? And all right. So um, then, so before, uh, before you leave, don't forget to leave a comment uh, because feedback uh, always um, makes us improve um, as teachers. Um, and also, um, I wish you all the best with your final exams. Um, looking at your answers, you people are doing quite well. Um, so I know PERA people always do quite good in their exams. We do very well in our clinicals um, because our exposure to patients are really good. Our teachers are really good. Um, and I hope you all will carry on teaching your sisters and brothers um, as um, we do as well. Okay? Uh, Madam, uh, yeah. Madam, I would like to thank on behalf of uh, medical students. Uh, it mm -hmm. was a great lecture and it was interactive. Uh, normally, people tend to sleep during these hours because it's tiresome with the clinicals and everything. And uh, it was helpful because today uh, we had a discussion with uh, Dr. Gihan about a patient who had dual pathologies. A, a fibroid, uh, a patient uh, who was having a fibroid uh, with underlying subfertility. So, mm -hmm. the discussion went on in the fibroid pathway, madam. So, subfertility was, I mean, it was not a complaint by the uh, person and uh, mm -hmm. patient. So I think mm -hmm. this discussion was a good ad adjunct to uh, our discussion. Man. So it was right. helpful. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. All right. It's nice talking to you all. Um, and I enjoyed your questions very much. Okay.